So this is the informal title of my talk, um, which is uh, once you have a planet candidate, something you think is a planet, how do you figure out if it's actually a real planet? Um, and so to talk about this, to answer this question, I want to go through a specific example in some detail. So here is a planet candidate. And so the left-hand uh, plot shows the light curve, so magnitude as a function of time. And then the right-hand panel shows a little zoom around the, the very peak, the, the brightest part of this event. And so this is a planet candidate. Why do I think it's a planet candidate? Well, if I look at the left-hand plot, I see a, that the light curve is dominated by something that's like a smooth rise and then a more or less smooth fall. And so that means that the light curve is dominated by one single object, which would be a star. And so mostly what we're seeing here is a star. But then I also see that the, in the magnitude scale on the left, the event is changing by five magnitudes, which is a factor of 100 in magnification. And so this event is very highly magnified, which means that the source must pass very close to the position of the lens. And so that tells me that if the source is getting very close to the lens, but is still more or less dominated uh, by this single lens light curve, then whatever caustic structure that we're talking about must be very small. In addition to that, if you look at the zoom, you can see that there's two little lumps there but the magnitude of, of that change in, in, in brightness is only about one magnitude. And so it's a fairly small perturbation. And therefore, because we have a light curve that's mostly dominated by a single star, and then we see a small perturbation, that's evidence that this thing could be a planet. And so that's very exciting. Uh, but the question is, the big question is, is this actually a planet? And so to understand that, takes me to the first part of the talk, which is to, say, to relate the caustics that we see in the magnification patterns to the actual light curves that are observed. And so here, on the right, I've shown that same zoom of the data, and now there's a model drawn over it. And the model's quite nice. The model goes through the data. The left-hand picture shows the caustic structure, and that's in red. And then it shows this blue line, which is the trajectory, the motion, the path that the source takes across this caustic structure. And so we can see that the model is a good representation of the data. But the question is, is this the only representation of the data? And if it isn't, is it the best representation of the data? Right? Because this model corresponds to a planet with a mass ratio of 0 0.005, which is sort of uh, five times the mass ratio of Jupiter to, to the sun. So that's good for a candidate for a planet. But we need to figure out if there are any false positives, if there are actually better models for this light curve. Um, and so in order to do that, I want to start by talking a little bit in detail about how the caustic structure on the left and the trajectory of the source across this caustic structure produces the light curve on the right. because you really need to understand the caustic structure and the magnification pattern in order to understand how you get the light curves you, you get and also what kind of degeneracies and problems you can run into when searching for the best model. And just so you know, I can't see you. So to make sure that you're all paying attention, there will be a quiz. And Kaylin will administer this quiz on my behalf. So, so you've met Kaylin, and so he's going to help me with that. Okay, so this is, on the left, we have that same caustic structure. And on the right, we have the full magnification pattern. So you take a planet with a mass ratio of five times 10 to the minus three, you put it at a separation of about half an Einstein ring radius away from its host star. And it produces a full, the full magnification pattern shown on the right. And so as the source passes over this magnification pattern, it creates little features and bumps and wiggles. Um, that produce the light curve that you observe. And so you can see on the left that the shape of the caustic is reflected in the shape of the magnification pattern. And so you can recall that the caustic occurs where there's formally an infinite magnification. So there's a bunch of mathematics that you can uh, derive and, and use to calculate this magnification pattern. 
and there's a point at which that magnification will just be infinity. And that's shown by the red caustic. And you can see in the right-hand panel how that caustic structure is reflect, reflects the underlying magnification pattern. And now, super expert microlensers see this caustic structure on the left, and they just infer through Vulcan mind meld the full magnification pattern that you see on the right. And so I want to talk about how these features all relate to each other so that you too can use Vulcan mind meld to uh, take a caustic structure and reconstruct in your mind the full magnification pattern that you see on the right. And so a caustic structure has two basic sets of features. It has cusps, which are the points of the caustic. This one has four points, three on the left, one on the right. And it has folds, which are basically the sides of the caustic. And there's, there's four folds here. And so here in this picture, I've overlaid the caustic structure on top of the magnification pattern on the left. So you can see the caustic and the magnification pattern. And then that little white box is a little zoom in on a full, uh, just highlights the full part of the caustic. And so if you imagine a source traveling from top to bottom on this slide, it's going to pass over across that fold. Cost, uh, that fold. And uh, so it'll pass from outside the caustic to inside the caustic. And that's what's shown in the right-hand picture. So on the bottom panel, you see the caustic is in red. And now instead of moving from top to bottom, the source is moving from left to right. And then the top panel above that shows the magnification curve um, that results from that motion. So on the bottom, you've got the source moving from left to right as it moves across. It hits that caustic in red, it undergoes a jump in magnification, and then it remains more magnified as long as it's inside of the caustic. And so that creates the left hand side of the eye of Sauron that uh, Kaylin showed earlier. And so you can see that, relate that back to the magnification pattern on the left. You're traveling from top to bottom, you hit the caustic, there's a big jump in magnification, and then the whole inside of that caustic is lighter, so brighter than the space outside of it. And that creates your fold crossing. So, uh, fold crossing. so a fold crossing of a caustic gives you a sharp jump in magnification. It stays magnified while it's inside the caustic. And then the caustic exit is just the, the reverse of it. It goes up a little bit and then has a sharp fall in magnification back to some baseline level. If you look instead at a cusp, one of the corners of the caustic, you can see that the influence of the cusp actually extends out from the caustic itself into the magnification pattern. So there's this little finger of light that comes out from this cusp, this cusp of the caustic. And so if you imagine a source that's traveling uh, sort of at a 45 degree angle to this cusp, that's what's shown in the lower right hand uh, corner. So there's a cusp there, which is shown in red, your source is passing below that cusp, passes over this little finger of light, and you get this little spike in magnification, which you can see in the top panel. And so a fold creates a jump in magnification, and it's, there's always a pair of jumps, because if you go into a caustic, you must come out of it. And a cusp will create a little lump in a magnification pattern, okay? And so if we go back to our light curve, now I've rotated the caustic structure, on the left um, so that the source trajectory is sort of parallel to the x-axis. And so you can see that the light curve on the right, it has a big lump followed by a little lump. And so you get that because as the source is moving from left to right across the caustic, it crosses that first cusp, that's the big lump, and then it passes near that cusp that's in between the middle cusp, and that gives you the little lump. And so you have two cusp, uh, you have one cusp crossing and a cusp approach, so there's two cusps that the source interacts with, and that gives you the two bumps in the light curve. And so that's how you get this light curve on the right. Now the question is, are there other trajectories, are there other caustics that can produce a similar light curve to the one that we have um, going through these data? All right, so is this the only model, uh, given that this is like a Q times uh, 10 to the minus five or five times 10 to the minus three uh, mass ratio planet. So this brings us to the first degeneracy in microlensing. You'll recall that Caitlin showed a, a picture very similar to this. So the lens is in the center, the source is the dash, uh, the little red dotted circle. The dashed line is the Einstein ring. 
And the source is, is lensed into two images, the major image and the minor image, which are shown in blue. And the planet acts as a perturbation. It perturbs one of these images. But you'll see that there's two images. And so if you have one perturbation, there's two images, it could perturb either one. So there's two possible solutions, and you have to check both of them. And so I've shown you one possible solution with um, the planet at half an Einstein ring radius, at sort of at S of 0.55. Um, and if you take that same planet and you move it to one over that separation, so one over S, which is 1.83, that's what's shown in the right-hand panel. And so this is the full caustic structure. Kaylin talked a little bit about planetary caustics and central caustics. The planetary caustics on the left for the close thing, there's that pair um, on the far left. And for uh, the wide solution, there's the little diamond on the right. And the planetary caustics in these two cases are very different. But if I zoom in on the caustic in each case that's centered more or less on the origin at zero, zero, those two central caustics are basically the same. Like by eye, I can't tell. I, I, I've looked at these. I've tried to decide if they're different. I, I don't really think they are. Um, and so you can make that same source trajectory. So I had a source trajectory going from the lower right-hand corner to the upper left-hand corner. And that produced, uh, using the left-hand caustic, our light curve. But it turns out you can do the same thing with the right-hand caustic and produce the same light curve. So there's a degeneracy in the separation of the planet relative to its star. And sometimes that degeneracy is broken, sometimes it's not. You can only figure that out if you've done detailed fitting. Uh, but there's actually other degeneracies that you can have. And so this is the part with the quiz. And on the left, I've shown the caustic structure. It's the same caustic structure in all, all four panels. In the left is the caustic structure we've seen before. The blue line is the trajectory of the source, and then the model is shown in the bottom. And then we have trajectories A, B, and C going through this caustic structure. And so I want you to take a minute and look at these and ask yourself which of these will produce a light curve that's similar to the one that we've already identified. And maybe take a minute and talk to your, to your, to your neighbors about it. Um, and then give you some time to talk. And then Caitlin's going to report to me when, how that's going. Maybe give it a minute. Jen, can, oh. yeah. Jen, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm about to take uh, an informal poll. And so remember, it's trajectories, so it could be more than one. So I could be more than one. It could be. No, uh, so how many people think A? Matches, that is like two to nine. Anyway, it's a large number. How many people think B? Uh, a couple, couple for B. How many people think C? Uh, so maybe half the room for C and like 90% for B and like 1%, sorry, what did I say? 90% for A, half for C, 1% for B. Okay, right. Well, here's the, here's, the, ooh, here's the answers. This is what the light curves actually look like. And so you're basically right. Uh, if you look at A, A is a, just a perfect reflection across the x-axis. Right, so there's a perfect symmetry in, in the magnification pattern 
when you reflect it across the, the axis between the star and the planet. And so that gives you a model that's identical to the model on the left. And so that particular symmetry we don't care too much about because the planet parameters are all the same, S is the same, Q is the same. But that illustrates the nature of the problem, that there are symmetries in, and similarities in the caustic structure in the magnification pattern that can produce similar light curves. And that's, that's the basic problem. The basic problem is that this caustic structure, the magnification pattern, is a two-dimensional structure. And you're trying to reconstruct it on the base of having this little 1D slice, which is your light curve, that you've taken out of it. In B, what you can see is that the source is passing uh, from top to bottom, and it's giving you just one little spike, one, one, one big spike in the center instead of two lumps. So that's not such a great uh, representation of the light curve. Um, but in C, what you see is that that's not a perfect representation, but when it passes over that cusp, you get a big lump, and then it passes near that second cusp, and you get a smaller lump. And it doesn't really look like the light curve, but it's hard to say is that because it's a bad representation of the light curve, or is it just because I didn't optimize these parameters and I was just drawing random trajectories through the thing, or through the caustic structure by eye. And so you would actually have to fit that solution to figure out which one is actually the true and correct solution. Um, yeah. So the answer is actually that you know, the light curve I initially showed you is, is the right answer, and this thing is a planet, but you can't figure that out without actually fitting it. Um, and so here is another example of a light curve. This light curve is very similar to the first light curve that I showed. So the bottom panel shows the full light curve. It undergoes a change in, in magnitude of about two or three magnitudes, so very, reason, very, fairly highly magnified. The zoom at the top shows you very similar morphology, two lumps, right? Is this also a planet? It looks very, very similar to MOA 293. And in fact, I see light curves like this all the time. And I think, oh, that is just like MOA 293. It could be a planet. But in this case, if you actually do the detailed modeling, you find that no, it's not a planet. The mass ratio here is 0.73. And so that's binary star mass ratio, but you get that same kind of morphology, but a very different shaped caustic. So in this case, instead of having three cusps on the left and one cusp on the right, there's just four more or less evenly distributed cusps. And when the source trajectory passes over that first cusp, you get that big lump, and then it passes sort of obliquely by that second cusp, and that gives you that second little lump. And this thing is not a planet though. And so it's just a very, different system that produces a very similar light curve. And so we talked about the basic problem in modeling uh, a microlensing event and in finding its true solution, which is on the left, you have the real solution, which is five times 10 to the minus three mass ratio planet at a separation of 0.55, and they've got this angle. Uh, where the angle of the source trajectory is 138 degrees. But then you also have a comparable solution in the second panel where all I've done is move the planet outside the Einstein ring to one over the separation. And that one is like, it's, it's very slightly disfavored if you uh, look at the modeling in the actual paper, it's very slightly disfavored. But honestly, if somebody went to this system and looked at it and told me, you know what, it's not at 0.55, it's at 1.83, I'd be like, Oh, yeah, okay. I'm not real bothered by that. That's not terribly surprising, even though the, the far left solution is the most preferred solution. At the same time, there's also this kind of similar solution in, in the third from the left thing, where you have same mass ratio, same separation, but totally different angle that gives you this same kind of morphology, big lump followed by a little lump. And so maybe you could say, well, maybe if I adjust these parameters, if I change S and Q some, and Kaylin showed you how S and Q govern the shape of this caustic, maybe you just change its shape a little bit and you get something that looks pretty good. For example, if you just jack up the mass ratio, you get this, the cusps on the left separate, and then and so you get four more evenly distributed cusps, and you get that thing on the right, which corresponds to the MOA 146 
um, binary system, which has a very, very similar morphology, big lump, little lump. Um, and just if you just have the data, it's really hard to tell which answer is going to be the correct answer, and you just have to fit for it. And so that brings me to the next part of my talk, which is techniques for finding the right model. And so in microlensing, we have a problem, which is that the chi-square surface is complex. So again, I'm showing the same caustic structure, and all I'm doing is I'm taking that trajectory for the source and just changing the angle of that trajectory relative to the origin um, with a fixed impact parameter. And then I'm calculating relative to those data, what is the chi-square? And so that's what's shown in the right-hand panel. So this is chi-square on the, the y-axis, and then the angle of the trajectory along the x-axis. And so because it's chi-square, smaller is better. And so you can see that there is one global minimum, which is the solution that I've been showing. But the surface has many local minima in it, and it also has many extreme maxima, maxima of various sizes, including uh, things that go off the top of the plot. Those ones are actually places where the model failed. I don't really know why, um, but if I were just doing a blind search of parameter space, that's something I would have to contend with. I'd have to try to figure out why that is, um, but it creates really strong barriers in between uh, each of these minimums. And so you have to be really careful about how you're, what kind of optimizer you use to, uh, to maximize your likelihood or alternatively minimize the chi-square. So for example, a simple downhill minimization algorithm won't work. If you start at this blue dot in, in the chi-square surface, the trajectory and the light curve are shown on the left, if you start there, that's a local minimum. And so if you have a simple downhill, uh, uh, downhill algorithm for minimizing the chi-square, it'll just be there and anywhere it tries to take a little step to the left or the right, it'll say, oh, the chi-square is bigger to the left or the right. And so I'm good. I'm in the minimum. I'm going to stay here. And that's bad because that's not actually the minimum. There's this local maximum here, which is the barrier that prevents you from moving from that local minimum to the true global minimum, which is shown in red. And so you can't just use a simple downhill algorithm. So amoeba simplex algorithms are not great. Um, for doing uh, mi microlensing uh, for that reason, unless you seed them with the right seeds so that you capture this full parameter space. And that's one of the tricks I'll get to. So if you can't use a simple downhill algorithm, though, what do you use? Well, commonly, what we use in microlensing is a Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. And so let's say that I start at the white dot. Then the way that a Markov chain Monte Carlo work works is it works as a random walk. So you take a small step from that white, white dot and you ask, well, is it better? If it's better, then you say yes and you accept that step and you start over at that new, start, new place, take another small step, ask, is this small step better? And if it's yes, you accept it again. And so it will go straight, it'll, it'll go to a uh, minimum. But if you take a small step and it's worse, it asks, is it better? And you get no, then it randomly decides whether you accept or reject that step. And so it can go up again. It just happens in a sort of random way. And it is less likely that it will accept the, the, the step um, if it's a lot worse than, than your current step. But it does allow you to get out of a local minimum, climb over that barrier, and get to the global minimum. So the advantage of a Markov chain Monte Carlo is that it works as a random walk. And so it will eventually explore all of parameter space, including all of the multiple minima. The disadvantage to the mark of Chan Monte Carlo is that it may take the age of the universe to do this. And since we would all like to publish papers and, you know, you, many of you would like to get your PhDs, this is not super great. Um, you don't, you probably don't want to wait the age of the universe to do that. And so we often apply, uh, apply a hybrid approach. So one hybrid approach is to do a grid search in S, Q, and angle. And so you fix the separation and you fix the mass ratio of the, the companion to the lens. And that fixes the caustic structure. And so then you're looking, given for a fixed caustic structure, for a fixed magnification pattern, what, is the, what are the optimal geometric parameters of the, tra of the source trajectory that can explain um, the light curve that you have? And to do this, though, you need to make sure 
that you're sampling enough angles, right? So in that, in this chi-square versus angle diagram that I showed you earlier, there are multiple minima here. And so you have to seed your angles with enough density that you capture all of the minima, right? Because if your grid is too sparse, you'll miss some of the, these solutions. In this case, we do happen to have one in the global minimum, which is good, but if you, know, you could imagine that if I shifted this whole grid of alpha to the left a little bit, you might miss it, um, and that would be bad. But at the same time, you don't want your grid to be too dense, because if you have many, many seeds in the same minimum, you're just repeating your effort, and then it takes longer to do all of your calculations, and you get back into that age of the universe problem. And so a grid search, if you combine a grid search with an MCMC, the grid search is used to seed the values, to, do, uh, to seed the initial conditions for several MCMCs. And that can be much more efficient than doing the MC, MC alone, both because you have better seeds and you start presumably sampling parameter space better, also because you have fewer parameters that you actually have to optimize in each case. And so this is good for a blind systematic search. But the disadvantage is that there's an art to selecting your grid size so that it's dense enough to capture all possibilities, all of the local minima, without being so dense that it takes forever to run. So there is another approach. Instead of doing an alpha grid that's uniform, you can use a light curve library. And so what's a light curve library? In a light curve library, you use your deep knowledge of the caustic structure to pre-generate a whole bunch of different light curves uh, of microlensing events, hypothetical microlensing events. And then you just flip through your library and see which ones fit your data the best. And so this is an example of a library that samples all of these different minima. So on the left-hand panel, I show many different trajectories. And then in the right-hand panel, I show again that same chi-square surface and then dots along that surface showing where I drew each of these trajectories from. And then in the bottom, the different light curves that those trajectories correspond to. And so what you can actually see in the left-hand panel is that there's symmetries um, in terms of these trajectories. And so if you think about, uh, Okay, if you look at the cyan one, the cyan one is sort of like the inverse of the black one, right? It's just, it cross, crosses a cusp um, and it um, travels from right to left. And so it passes the, the side of the caustic with just the one cusp and then crosses the cusp on the three cusp side. And then, but the black one does the opposite. It passes the side with the three cusp side and then passes the side with the, the one cusp side. And those, so those two solutions are related to each other. And so this light curve library, if you were using that approach, you wouldn't actually have to necessarily do both the cyan one and the black one. You could just mirror image your test light curve. Um, and I don't wanna go too much more into this because it's not, that likely that you're going to use this uh, particular strategy, but it is a good one if you really understand caustics well and the various morphologies that you get out of microlensing light curves. It's just that it requires that understanding. And so you use that light curve library to seed your Markov chain Monte Carlo to make it more efficient. So you get a more efficient seeding of parameter space and you don't necessarily overcount uh, over count certain solutions like when you if you use the angle grid. If you use an angle grid, then you end up, um, you can end up with many seeds with the same, with basically the same angle um, as far as the caustic structure is concerned. And so it can make you less likely to miss solutions and it can be more efficient, but then the disadvantage of this light curve library approach is that there's a lot of effort that goes into setting it up. You need to make sure that you've got enough trajectories in it that it covers all possibilities. Um, and all of the basic morphologies that you get out of a microlensing light curve. And so you need a really deep knowledge of the caustic structures that are produced um, by microlensing events in, in order to use the strategy. Uh, okay, and I have a few minutes, so I just wanna talk about another planet candidate briefly. Uh, so this is another light curve where you see a mostly smooth lump and that's due to the underlying star. And then there's this short time scale perturbation, which I've highlighted uh, with a little circle. 
and that's a planet candidate. And so then the question becomes, again, is this actually a planet or is it some perturbation due to some other kind of false positive like a binary star? And this is the result. So the problem with this particular planet candidate is there's only partial data and you only cover the caustic entrance. And so that's shown on the right. Those are the data zoomed in on that caustic or on that perturbation. And so you see the caustic entrance, the sharp rise in magnification, and then it kind of hangs out at a level above the baseline level. But there's eight different models, well, eight and a half different models that can explain this data corresponding to eight sets of caustics and trajectories shown on the left. And actually, if you look at like wide two, which is the right-hand column of the caustics in the second from the top, there's actually two different solutions that are related to each other, but somewhat different and distinct. Um, and, and so all of these represent local minima that explain these data. Now you can tell right off that the ones on the bottom row, the four solutions, if you look at the data versus the model, that doesn't look so good, right? So the data has structure to them and the model is flat, but it is a local minimum and it needs to be understood and you need to understand in the fitting whether it doesn't look good because it's actually bad or if it doesn't look good because it's not optimized properly. And so, if you look at each of these solutions uh, in detail, these are those, those eight models. Um, and the local minima are distinguished by what's going on on a larger scale, on the large scale behavior. And so the bottom shows the full light curve, and then the top shows a zoom just around the caustic structure. And so like the pink one and the blue one are, or the magenta and the blue ones, that's the big caustic structure on the top that gives you that trough without seeing but um, leaves out the entrance. And so that is inconsistent with other parts of the light curve. And so that's why that's disfavored. Um, but you actually have to do these full grid searches um, in order to find all the possible local minima and figure out what this is. In this case, it's not quite resolved. Um, and there's a degeneracy between a Q equals 0.034-ish and like a Neptune mass ratio planet. So it could be a brown dwarf or it could be a Neptune. And we can't actually tell on the basis of the modeling alone because we only have this partial data and there are many degenerate uh, solutions that can fit it. And so you just want to be careful about that. Um, and so part three is resources. So now that you know all this stuff, you might want to actually try it for yourself and play with some data yourself. Um, and so there's some resources for generating microlensing models. There's actually three different public codes. Some of them are, are related to each other. Um, New Lens Model is a Python code which generates models, and there's some examples of how you would fit to data. Uh, and it's the code that I use to make the figures in this plot generate those caustic structures and the fake light, and, and the, the light curve models that come out of them. There's also PyLima, which is also written in Python, and it fits models to data and includes examples. PyLima has some built-in fitting functions, uh, which can be convenient, but you should use any fitting function with caution, because if you're in a local minimum, depending on how your settings for your fitting function are set, it can just find that local minimum, and it will just report, oh, I have well explored this local minimum. Everything has been successful. But it won't tell you whether or not it's actually fully explored parameter space or um, whether or not you've actually found the global minimum. So whenever you're fitting microlensing models, especially if you're using a canned routine, just be cautious of that. And just because it says it's been successful, you have to understand the context in which it's saying that it's, that it's successful, which is often, I have well explored the local minimum that I am in. And I have successfully explored that and found the value. But figuring out if that's the global minimum is harder, and you want to be cautious about that. Uh, the third package here is VBBL, which is Valerio Boza's binary lensing uh, code. It uses C++ to generate microlensing models uh, to high accuracy, um, accounting for all real effects. And that code is actually incorporated into both new lens model and PyLima. Other resources include public data. Let's say you want to actually play with some data and fit models to data. Uh, the data from the published planets are in the Exoplanet Archive. So for example, this 
the example that I started with is MOA 2011 bulge 293, and I just downloaded those data from the Exoplanet Archive, and then I fit it using MuLens model. Uh, there's also data from the Korea Microlensing Telescope Network Survey. The data for microlensing events from 2015 and from K2C9 are fully public, and they're available from the KMTNet website. Uh, there's also data there for 2016 and 2018, uh, but those are under a proprietary period that's not over yet. But um, the 2015 and K2C9 data are fully public. And then finally, there's the UCRIT microlensing survey, which has all data for all of the stars in the survey, including, I think there's, there's millions of light curves there. Some of them are microlensing events. Um, and so those are also available from the Exoplanet Archive. And then finally, if you wanna, we're currently running a microlensing data challenge. And there's 293 WFIRST like light curves, and a sampling of them is shown here. And the challenge is to just solve as many of them as you can. Find out the correct model, decide whether or not it's microlensing, figure out what the model parameters are. And so you're welcome to participate in that um, and to just fit as many or as few as you want. Um, and there's more information about that at microlensing-source.org. And so this is the word summary of, of my talk, but I'm just gonna skip to my, my picture summary, which is, just that the caustic structures govern the degeneracies that you see that you encounter in microlensing and that you can get different morphologies from similar caustic structures or for just from similarities and symmetries in the caustic structures and so I will take questions now thank you thunderous applause in case you can't hear it <laughs> I will transpose transcribe, dictate questions to Jen. Questions? That was all pretty terrifying, wasn't it? <laughs> all right, I'll start off. Oh, sorry, Fritz will go. So in the time depth, are there any around Jupiter? Fritz wants to know if the contest will contain any moons around Jupiters, which were some questions for Kaylin previously. Um, the the data challenge or the yeah the data yeah. analysis challenge I actually I have no idea the people who constructed that challenge have explicitly refused to tell anybody anything about what's in there um, there's some word sampling uh, you know there's there's binary stars in there there's some variable star examples there's some planets but I have no idea whether or not there are planets around brown dwarfs or or, or moons around Jupiter it's entirely possible but uh -huh. I figure they put some Easter eggs in there, but but they actually won't tell me what they've put in there to keep the experiment uh, pristine. So, Jen, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. given all of these computational challenges, looking forward to the WFIRST microlensing survey, how do you imagine that's going to play out? Can you just give us your perspective on what that's going to look like modeling-wise? Well, there are some tricks that you can play right so you know where the image so for example many of the w first planets will be planetary caustic like planets which is similar to the ones to the the last one i showed that kmt in that event where it's a mostly smooth like curve with a little bump on it and that one you could see that part that a large part of the problem with that particular planet was that we had only partial data why did we have only partial data because it was raining somewhere um, uh, and so W first doesn't have rain, and so that helps a lot. Um, and so you'll get better data coverage. Uh, but you can also uh, use pl planets like that have a more constrained set of models that you can um, test. But I do. I worry so, about so this. I think and what so, you're saying is that the, con the continuous coverage of W first will help break a bunch of these degeneracies? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Alex? The question is, if you have good parallax information, can you break some of the degeneracies in the model? Sometimes. Sometimes it makes it worse. <laughs> 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 Wait, how can it make it worse? So you know how I said I didn't really care about the reflection across the x-axis? Well, it turns out when you have parallax, you do care about that reflection because your parallax is directional. And so you'll introduce a curvature to that and whether it curves it down or up, 
the source trajectory down or up uh, affects the, the two trajectories reflected across the x-axis uh, differently. So you have more information, but it just opens up more possibilities. Right. And so sometimes it helps and sometimes it makes it worse. <laughs> Okay. Do you ever have to worry about the changing separation due to the orbit of the planet or the or is it too, or is the microlensing event too short for that? That that is the question. Um and so so yes, the short answer is yes, and the situations in which you need to worry about it depend on the time scale of your event. So some events are 10 days and some events are 60 days and the 60 day events you're more likely to have this this issue. Um, and it also depends on how well you've covered the caustic structure and or caustic features and how uh, how many of them there are and how close they are in time. Um, because you can imagine if you see a sharp change in magnification, right? When you have this caustic entrance, this eye of Sauron feature, sorry, uh, you get this sharp spike in magnification, and that actually creates a, a time in the light curve that's pinned. And you know that time really precisely within seconds. And so if you have two times like that, then you have two points that are really pinned. And so the duration of the planetary perturbation and the various features in the light curve really uh, in proportion to the orbit of the planet is, is what matters. And you do need to fit for that. So are there published examples of microlensing planets that had to take this into account? Yes. Okay. Okay, no more questions for the audience, so let's thank Jen again. Okay. Thank you. And now I believe we have pops.